Campfires on the beach are a memorable and long celebrated tradition of a Cape Cod summer. First Encounter Beach is one of the best places to see the sunset over the water on the Cape. This year, we are unable to gather together for such an event, but are still able to celebrate this tradition through selected stories and speakers commemorating the 400th anniversary of the first encounter between the Nauset people and the English who ventured to this beach on December 8, 1620, in search of a place to settle. 400 years later, those of us on Cape Cod still face many of the same issues. What is it like to be an immigrant here? How do the native people feel about our presence? How have humans impacted this area in 400 years? And how has the landscape changed? Please join us this summer as we explore these issues and the lore of East Ham over the years since this first encounter. You can find these campfire programs on the East Ham 400 website posted every Sunday night in July and August. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the East Ham 400 Campfire Series. Returning again from last week is scientist and cartographer from the National Seashore, Mark Adams. Besides his work with the seashore. He also is very interested in ecology and human migration, and he's here today to talk about some of his experiences in that field and how all these things are related. Thank you, John, and thank you, East Ham, uh, for uh, listening to me a second time. My interest in the systems of Cape Cod and how the geology of Cape Cod wor works has uh, also fueled my interest in how we fit as humans into the systems that make the world work. And one of my interests has been about migration and ecology. And uh, I think that part of our responsibility is to learn to be good animals in nature. As humans, we need to be good animals, which means to live within our means, to live sustainably, and to be a part of a, of a system and a habitat. And so also, I've had the opportunity to be an exhibiting artist in Cape Cod for 25 years. Um, I show at the schoolhouse in Provincetown, and I've had some, a bunch of group shows. I'm very proud to be part of the arts community. And as an artist, I'm always looking for a way to use what's important to me as a part of my artistic expression and to make everything I do in service of something bigger. So here's an attempt to try to weave some of these things together. Um, I'm going to just do a quick review of the systems of Cape Cod that I talked about last week, that we are in the Gulf of Maine. We're not just a little tiny spit of sand. We're part of this basin and part of the North Atlantic Ocean and part of the world. It's a global system. Um, uh, you probably know this geology that I spoke about before, that the Cape has been constantly changing for 20,000 years. Uh, the history of migration covers that period and about eight times that time period. But it's very interesting, when we talk about geology, we uh, sometimes leave out the story of humans and how they got here. Um, again, this was, is the uh, kind of the iconic picture of the wave action that moved the sand around the Cape that's created the Provincetown hook out of the sands of East Ham, Wellfleet, and Truro over the last six to 8,000 years. Uh, and you know, we often think that these storms and events are these epic, iconic moments that they're, they're earth changing, when they actually just mean that we planted our flag in a changing earth. And it's us that needs to change. The earth is not, these aren't really symbols of a great change in the planet earth. They're a system of uh, uh, they're us learning where the markers are and how we fit. Um, Again, I, w I just have this uh, interesting fable of how each wave moves a, a bit of sand around the beach. Uh, if you think that there's, let's say, a wave hitting the shoreline every five to eight seconds, uh, and each wave holds a cubic yard of sand, uh, you can multiply out and, and extrapolate out. If you're sitting on the beach in East Ham or Wellfleet, there's the equivalent of 150 dump trucks of sand going by every day. This is this process of the world that, as it changes in front of us, that we barely notice. 
so that's a truck every 10 or 15 minutes moving sand along the shoreline and reshaping our coast. My work here allows me to measure that in conjunction with the Center for Coastal Studies and to tell people that story, which is a real um, privilege, um, and to use GPS and technology to understand, again, these events that seem earth-shaking to us. But, you know, here's uh, an, the inlet that formed in... Uh, um, Let's see, this is the uh, Pleasant Bay Inlet. This is the 2007 inlet that everyone debated, was ready to bet an entire cup of coffee about whether or not it would close up again, and now it's the dominant inlet in uh, Pleasant Bay. Uh, again, we build on the shoreline without knowing that the, uh, uh, the time is coming due when the shoreline retreat will catch up with us. But as an artist, I like to go in the field and sketch uh, directly from nature and get a, an experience of the moment of the place that is uh, something unique to me, to my point of view, and is kind of like all of us, we have a vantage point to see the world um, in a way that only our individual perception allows us to see. It was a show I had in 2017 at the museum in Provincetown where I reproduced the whole Gulf of Maine map on the floor of the museum so that people could walk around it and see, get a little sense of the scale, the human scale within the larger global world. Um, and so, you know, here's Herring. Here's one of our iconic migrators. Uh, migration is a part of ecology and behavior. Uh, the trait of migrating is part of so many animals. Every branch of the animal kingdom has journeys that take place through water and land, swimming, walking, drifting. Um, this is not just a unique biological phenomenon, but it transcends species. And it's one of the defining traits of humans and animals, their mobility, their freedom to move. Um, so just a couple examples of our champion migrators that we see in Cape Cod. The red knot passes through Cape Cod on its Atlantic coastal migration and has this very particular timing where it comes to Pleasant Bay and Nauset Marsh just when the horseshoe crabs are laying their eggs. and uh, um, if that didn't happen, they would miss one of their essential food sources that allows them to complete their journey and make a new generation of red knots. So the timing of the planet is like an interconnected clock. The Arctic tern migrates from pole to pole. Some of them nest in Massachusetts and Cape Cod. Again, why this, this extreme uh, movement? Why is it? It's, and in the animal world, it's usually because there's a particular niche, there's a benefit, there's an adaptation that allows them to find their place in the world that is safe to reproduce. And it's successful for them while other animals find other niches. And, uh, you know, the, in, in ecology, they look for a way to not compete with each other or not have confrontations with the needs of other species. Here's the flyways around the world. Again, just showing how common migration is and how much it's a part of the, the, the clock and the, uh, the heartbeat of the planet. Um, and then there's also uh, not just these polar seasonal migrations. Uh, these are wildebeest in Africa, uh, the monarch butterflies, whose migration pattern transcends generations so that the monarch butterfly caterpillars that are unborn are somehow stamped with uh, a destination and a need to migrate. Um, and we find great beauty and inspiration. Um, part of the, the balance of this idea of migration is that there's a source there and there's a destination. And the destination is a refuge. You need that refuge. You need a place to go um, for your migration to be successful. Um, and um, this is a fantastic concept that the, um, the entomologist at Harvard and philosopher E.O. Wilson has come up with a concept called half-earth. And the idea of half-earth is that we should be setting aside half of the area of the planet as refuges for animals to conduct their, their, both their migrations, their nesting and breeding, uh, their livelihoods, and that if we do that, if we create that refuge for the rest of the planet, there will be a refuge for humans as well, that fishing will benefit, that all the resources that are 
sort of provided free to humanity would be um, enhanced and would be sustainable if we had this. So the, the, so the green areas on this world map show the areas that are protected. The brown areas are, uh, let's see, um, let's see, brown areas are the unprotected areas that are in greatest need. And then there, the very tiny yellow areas are the actual essential parts of this half earth philosophy that are protected already. Um, and then in the ocean, the same thing goes. There's many protected areas in the ocean, but almost none of them are fully protected. Almost none of them are no-take zones. None of them are really places where fisheries can restore themselves or uh, even unfished species. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. So what is it about humans? You know, we think we're different. Um, we drive cars and we um, watch TV and we, our, our lives are just separate from nature, right? <laughs> um, we have a history and it doesn't, you don't have to go back very far to see the, uh, the, the initial spread of humans as humans evolved in Africa. This is kind of the pattern of, of dispersal of human, the, the various human species from Africa around the world. And it took a very short time it's, it's a mystery to me why humans have this compulsion to disperse and expand and migrate. I think it's really part of our culture from the very beginning. Um, this shows uh, the sources of, hum of human populations in, uh, let's see, thousands of years. So uh, you see, um, if we take 200,000 years as a marker for, the, for humans arriving on the planet, uh, Within 50,000 years, uh, they're in Europe, and uh, really 65,000 years to get to the furthest corner of the world, which would might be Australia, um, and and there we are. Uh, the Neanderthals, who kind of were outcompeted by the Homo sapiens, uh, this is kind of the extent of their spread in Europe, and. Uh, um, who knows? Maybe one of the reasons why the Neanderthals didn't survive is because they didn't have this compulsion to migrate and disperse around the planet. They weren't adaptable. They weren't uh, explorers and nomads. Uh, again, this is spe very speculative and non-scientific thinking. But another really traditional kind of migration that's very human, that's very part of our culture, is sometimes called transhumance. And this is very ancient uh, migration pattern involved in a pastoral culture where we herded animals, where we went from the highlands to the lowlands seasonally, following herds of sheep, uh, cattle, even horses. Uh, this shows the um, basically Romania, the Central Europe part, down to Greece, and these patterns of movement over time that really go back many thousands of years, well, several thousand years, anyway. And... Um, I want to shift now to something that's going on now that it's really kind of hidden in the headlines beyond some of our current crises of uh, uh, pandemic. And not to say that it's such a different issue, but this shows some of the current migration patterns around the Mediterranean for asylum seekers, for refugees. And uh, the Mediterranean is one of the hotspots of human migration. Uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of people fleeing wars and famine and oppressive governments and all kinds of failures of society to take care of people. Uh, a lot of these people are not migrants by choice. Uh, they, the only reason to take these dangerous journeys is that their homes have become much more dangerous. Uh, but as many people know, the the war in Syria, the, the, all the surrounding countries have been a big source of refugees. And of course their goal is to find asylum. And we have uh, uh, charters with the United Nations, the EU, the United States is a part of it, where asylum seekers are guaranteed a hearing. They're guaranteed uh, a consideration of a claim of asylum when they can't go home, when their lives are in danger, their livelihoods are in danger. And, but what, we make this very difficult for them. Uh, and in, these, in the Mediterranean, many people have to spend their last dollars with smugglers to go on an, a very dangerous sea journey 
to get to the gates of Europe to ask for asylum. And that danger, all those dangerous crossings, many people die unnecessarily. And this is before they even begin to ask for permission to, uh, for a hearing before a, a, a judge for a, 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 you know, to document their plight. Um, so, the, you know, there's three main routes around the Mediterranean. One of them is, is from Turkey to Greece through the islands. Another is from uh, uh, Libya, Tunisia, and North Africa into, Italy, France, and Spain. Um, but I'm gonna, and then of course, the parallel migration route, which is uh, very much in the news that we're very aware of is through the US border from Central America. This route channels people from Central America and South America, but even many African people end up on this migration journey. And uh, as many people know, they are, um, they, they, they arrive at some very hard and fast obstacles, uh, even though they have a right to a hearing to uh, a claim for asylum. And you know, I'm not here to uh, to even present a case about who deserves asylum and who doesn't. I just want to make the point that asylum is part of our basic agreement of human rights around the world. That if someone needs asylum, uh, that they deserve a hearing at least. Um, refugees and migrants, there's many words for this status, and some of them are pejorative, and some of them are perhaps a compliment. Some of them are even an aspiration for some of us. People on the move, snowbirds, seasonal residents, wash ashores, trekkers and pilgrims and nomads, uh, the transhumans I mentioned. But suddenly, uh, they take on a different shade, immigrant, migrant, displaced person, refugee, asylum seeker, and, you know, have a lot of kinship with homeless people and uh, with a fear of strangers. And the, but the idea that anyone by their nature, by their character, is an illegal person is, uh, to me, a, just a misunderstanding of our identity as fellow humans. Uh, no one is an illegal person. People... Some people commit crimes, some people have a, a status that's not um, substantiated or justified, but the people themselves are people. And so um, here's just a few really, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but uh, there's actually some, something like 40 million displaced people worldwide uh, internally within their own countries and another 20 million who are displaced uh, outside their own countries. Uh, and the countries like the US and Europe, some have accepted more than others, but uh, really the flow of, of migrants is, is just um, throttled at, at, the, you know, at the gates to uh, Western Europe and, and the US. Um, but we know that immigrants represent 15% of the US population, and for many of us, you don't have to go back too many generations f to call yourself an immigrant. Um, here sh this shows some of the sources of immigrants and their destinations around the world, many traveling northward. And let's see, let's go ahead. I just wanted to show how the sources of immigrants and the, their destinations very much matches the areas on the earth that are environmentally challenged. Shortages of water, famine, uh, temperature stress from climate change are the red areas. And... Uh, so we're really only going to see a huge increase in people on the move, in migrants seeking all kinds of asylum, climate refugees, uh, famine refugees, as well as political refugees. Um, and I think it's something that we should, uh, we should understand that could affect us personally um, or someone we know uh, in the generations to come. Uh, and I love um, Anthony Bourdain, the late Anthony Bourdain, um, I love this quote, if I'm an advocate for anything, it's to move as far as you can, as much as you can, across the ocean, or simply across the river, walk on someone else's shoes, or at least eat their food. It's a plus for everybody. Um, and so as an artist, I've tried to take these themes of migration and incorporate them into various works of art. Uh, each of these panels in this uh, wall piece represents 
uh, either an animal or a human migration location. Uh, there are, uh, there's uh, Lampedusa in the Mediterranean part of Italy. There's Gibraltar. There's Lesbos in Greece. Um, there's um, Point Reyes Bird Observatory. There's Nauset Marsh in Long Point in Provincetown. Um, and I made these boats as a benefit to uh, their sort of uh, handmade paper boats painted that were uh, where the proceeds went to uh, these migration places. There's a close-up of the, the Gibraltar piece with the emphasis on the swift, which is a bird that almost never lands, that is uh, kind of known in Latin as a, as a legless uh, nomad. Um, and the, uh, uh, the king eider that we see offshore that prefers to be off at sea. Um, again, just more paintings to represent this. Um, I've gone for the last three years to Lesbos to work in a refugee relief center. Um, this is, these are scenes from Lesbos of people arriving. This is um, Italy from Africa and uh, some uh, sketches based on this. It's, it's really an epic heroic drama and, and you know, both uh, sad and deeply human. This is an example of the boat the uh, very cheap smugglers' boats, which would, 50 people would pay thousands of dollars each for a seat on this boat to go the last few miles to Greece. And, uh, um, and the smugglers would just set them adrift with a tiny engine, and they'd have to make their way across. Here's the port with the Coast Guard in uh, Mytilene in Greece, um, and uh, some sketches of, of boats that were inspired by that. Um, You know, the, the idea of being a nomad is very appealing to us in our luxury, um, camping and traveling. Um, I kept sketchbooks along the way with maps and sketches and stories that people told me. Um, here's Lesbos, very close to Turkey, uh, 20,000 people in the main refugee camp on Lesbos. And uh, this is the town of Mytilene, again, in the same scale as a Cape Cod town with a harbor uh, with just happened to have 20,000 people camped outside its, uh, the city limits. And each day, some of those migrant boats would be caught on the rocks. And there's actually one functional rescue boat that can go out and guide them to shore right now. But there's a whole myriad of, of um, NGOs and volunteer groups that provide the services that the government doesn't provide. This is known as the, the life jacket graveyard on Lesbos. Uh, they've collected a lot of the barely functional life jackets that the refugees wore for the final crossing, and, uh, and, and it has become a monument to the, the numbers that have come through this portal to Europe. Um, I walked there with a few refugees one day and stood on top of this mountain of, uh, of uh, life jackets and heard some of their stories. Um, and again, these are people, if you, you know, one day I had to sit in the... Uh, guard shack of the refugee camp, watch people go by. And I really felt like I was in an urban mall in America, watching the familiarity of the families and people walking by, going in and out. But um, people are separated on the journey. Uh, and if they make it this far, there's still huge obstacles um, to their resettlement and to beginning their life. So this is a sample. This is a quick sketch of a refugee camp in Athens. Uh, of actually one of the nicest ones. There are container units that have two families per unit with the uh, water heaters on the roof. It's in the port on a, on a completely paved urban area. Um, but again, as I say, uh, that's sort of the luxury of it. Many people don't even have a container. They're camping in the olive groves and uh, getting a, a stipend for food. So I've worked with this organization called Help Refugees and um, which their principles are, are based on uh, uh, staying out of politics, but trying to provide the most basic level of human dignity and uh, sanitation um, and support uh, for people outside of any political action, just to make sure that mothers and children and families are um, treated with dignity. Um, we ran a, with, about a dozen other volunteers, 
a relief center called One Happy Family. In this place, we went every day. We'd, we had a uh, probably 1,500 or so refugees would come each day to spend the day with us. We had cafe and uh, English lessons and a clinic and basketballs, and, uh, and we'd serve hot lunch. And one of the most rewarding things that you can do is hand somebody a hot bowl of food. Um, so here's a little map of, of the refugee center. You know, I, I pretty much went here because I decided that I couldn't solve the bigger problems, so I wanted to just work directly with people, volunteer, and, um, and have some face-to-face -face contact. Here's the kitchen. This little shed in the back of this boathouse is the kitchen where we fed 1,500 people a day. They've upgraded it a bit since then, but basically it's a couple of gas burners in the floor, and we'd usually make, uh, they have full-time cooks, and we would uh, serve the food and, uh, and clean all the bowls and, and that sort of thing each day, but um, really excellent food, lentils and rice, one day a week was chicken, uh, flatbread, uh, we had tea, and uh, um, and as I said, this is this kind of, you know, basic human work is one of the most satisfying things you could do as, as an activist is just stir the pot. And it was a thrill to be in the kitchen with these people who were also really delighted to be there. Uh, there was usually some kind of hip hop music, Kurdish, German, Syrian hip hop music. And we danced all day while we were doing this. And we served these bowls. There'd be a thousand people in line, separated by men, men, women, and children. And we handed out the bowls and the flatbread as fast as we possibly could to get the line down. And, but giving each person a look in the eye and a, and a smile. This, this translates as drop in the ocean. And this is the, uh, some of the other donations that we distributed, food, I mean, uh, clothing, shoes. Um, there's a whole system. It's like running. Uh, an Amazon warehouse. Uh, we we get crates and crates of uh, of uh, boots and shoes and clothing. It had to be sorted and sized and cleaned, and um, and we then we'd get orders from families, observant Muslim family with two children and a and a grandmother that needed clothes and hygiene items, and we put together packets for each one, um, and uh, special menus for Ramadan. There's some of the friends I made, um, mostly Afghans, mostly, uh, well, let's see. I, I got to, um, well, I, I'll mention also that things like barbershops and beauty salons are some of the most humanizing things you can offer in terms of relief. It's to allow someone to feel clean and good looking and groomed is very humanizing and um, it's one of the biggest gifts, almost as important as food. Um, we had dance parties. Um, the Kurds love to dance, and they dance in big groups. Let's see if, if uh, this will go. Oh, I, okay. I had a little dance party scene there. Um, and then there were all kinds of holidays related to the countries they came from, and uh, including Kite Day, uh, in which we used recycled plastic garbage bags and reads from the marsh to make kites. I taught English, which allowed me to have direct contact with people on a really, um, almost a personal level, but people who didn't know the, the English alphabet at all, as, and, but were super eager to learn, people of all ages. And there was always, uh, in a midst of a class full of 30-something um, men and a few women, there would be a 12-year-old girl who knew all the answers, but always looked at her parents for permission to speak and show how much she knew. Um, basic questions, which in a way was a start of a westernization of, for them of speaking to each other, speaking to strangers about their name and their families, but also fraught because sometimes when we talked in our English classes about family and I thought, hey, this is universal, your grandparents, your grandchildren, your aunts and uncles, let's draw a picture of it. And I got silenced because many of them had lost all these family members in the journey. And so I realized how charged any simple uh, human explanation could be. At one point, I had an advanced English class, and I just happened to have in my notebook Mary Oliver's poem about a summer's day. 
and I, I, I didn't think to myself too much. I just pulled it out and said, let's, let's discuss this. And I, I, you could, many of you could probably tell me the last line of this Mary Oliver poem. Uh, and if we're, you're in the room with me, I'd let you speak it out to me. But it's basically, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? <laughs> I get uh, chills saying it. Um, and you wonder, these people who have lost everything and who, where the, their futures are uncertain, they relate. They relate keenly because they have big plans for their precious lives. Uh, the woman on the right was trained in, a, uh, as a, in business and cosmetology and wanted to open a string of salons. And the guy on the left was a computer programmer. Um, and right now they're living in a tent, but um, they weren't giving up those, those dreams. We also did geography. And people who didn't share a language knew half the countries on Earth and we would do these uh, online quizzes. On a, there's a program called Cetera, and some of them, well, they put us to shame in, in their knowledge of geography around the world. Uh, we did International Women's Day. We wrote things in different languages on signs on the wall. Um, there was one boy from, who was a Rohingya from Myanmar, and I said, you know, sh write something, whatever language, it doesn't matter, he speaks seven languages. But he said, no, I've been traveling since I was 11, I don't write. I, but he was one of those guys who knew the, the map of the world very well, and he knew all those languages. So these lives are arrested, they're, they're, these lives are, sorry, the wrong analogy there, their lives are stopped in their tracks, but they have um, uh, the same aspirations uh, as us. The, Turkey and Greece have a long history of refugee exchange and, um, and expulsions. For, after World War I, uh, many of the Turks who'd lived for generations in Greece were, were expelled under an agreement, and the, the Greeks who lived in Turkey were expelled, and there's monuments to this very wrenching moment in their history, and so they, there's still people alive who remember uh, when their grandparents were uprooted and they started new lives and this monument, um, there was a demonstration at this monument to that Greek-Turkish moment. And um, um, this is me doing a quick sketch uh, of the demonstration and, uh, and there's the result. And it commemorates an agreement three years ago between the Turkish government and the EU to send some of the refugees back, which has been wrenching. So as an artist, doing portraits of people is a way to bear witness. And uh, I started sketching portraits at the art table in the refugee center in One Happy Family and uh, quickly um, made friends with many people. And um, it's really an honor. Um, I see it, saw it as an honor, but for them to be recognized, to be drawn in a portrait uh, was being seen, which is something we all want. And each one of these people has a story um, and uh, hopefully a future. He drew me. <laughs> and, uh, and some of them I tried to draw as their aspirations. This guy was um, into anime and uh, fantasy, so I drew him as an elf. And this guy was a computer programmer, so I draw him as a bionic computer man. This is an example of the papers, the, um, the Auschweiz, which is, um, I believe it's the, the white paper, which gets blue stamp. Each of those blue stamps is a door opening into a future life. And uh, it takes months and months to get your, uh, once you have a, a, a registration as an asylum seeker, your interviews are can take up to two years to happen because of the lack of translators, because of the opposition of judges. Um, and then the very lucky ones, this gentleman in the middle, got his blue stamp to move away from the island and to Athens and get an apartment on his own. But it's actually uh, kind of wrenching along the way because here, at least in the journey in the pipeline of asylum seekers, of refugees. We had a little community. We had lunch every day. We had people to play football with. And uh, 
the one thing he wanted, he, he got, and he's being sent on to the mainland of Greece. But it takes him further and further away from his community, from his family, and puts him into the world where he has to create these uh, connections in his life all over again from scratch. Uh, many services along the way, but uh, again, this is one of my favorite ones, free movement skateboarding. And this is on Instagram, if anybody wants to look up. Um, I think it's uh, FM skateboarding, free movement. This is, oh, that's not it. There's a mobile, oh, I guess a lot. There's a, they have a mobile, uh, van with skateboards and and uh, uh, protective gear, and they teach little boys and girls skateboarding all over Athens. I'm going to skip through this. There's a pop-up restaurant, Syrian restaurant, place to gather with the refugees. Here's the skateboard park, uh, my sketch of a mobile skateboard park in Athens, where these little Syrian girls were uh, taking their hills for the first time, uh, super proud, super empowered. Um, and then I finally made a stop on Samos, which is another one of the Greek islands with very, much fewer services than Lesbos. Um, and I sat in the harbor and sketched and made friends with um, the kids who came along from Iraq, from Syria, and from uh, Afghanistan, and drew portraits. And, uh, um, and again, this is a place with almost no services at all. There's people really <laughs> camping out and uh, um, waiting. This is a few years ago when um, there were flocks of pelagic birds in Provincetown, and we kayaked right into the middle of them. These are birds that never came to shore. And it was a glimpse, again, of this human connection with the need to move, the, uh, that, that we are animals, we are good animals um, that exist in the world. And finally, I just want to close with this idea that I took from... Uh, 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 from the internet, from Maria Popova, uh, and it's um, basically we spend our lives trying to discern where we end and the rest of the world begins. We snatch our freeze frame of life from the simultaneity of existence by holding on to illusions of permanence, of illusions of congruence and linearity, of static selves and lives that unfold in sensical narratives. All the while, we mistake chance for choice. We think that we're here by choice when it's really chance. Our labels and models of things, those that we mistake those for the things themselves and our records for history. History is not what happened, but what survives the shipwrecks of judgment and chance. And some truths like beauty are best illuminated by the sidewise gleam of figuring, by meaning making. In the course of our figuring, orbits intersect unbeknownst to the bodies they carry. Um, just a little excerpt. and. Um, and then Toni Morrison, basically, when you get these jobs that you've been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. Love that. So thank you very much. That's just my own <laughs> personal view on what we can do and uh, how I see the world as an artist and ecologist. The lesson I learned from working in a refugee relief center in Greece is that we are all in this together. And any effort to show up and give people a smile and a hand is important, especially in light of the reality that so many displaced people have their lives suspended, waiting for the asylum process to consider their claim, and they're further paralyzed by the current pandemic lockdowns. These humans are just like us in their humanity and indeed, they could be any of our neighbors in their hopes for security and family and joy in their everyday lives. They're entitled to a hearing and a safe harbor, but meanwhile, they should have every chance to resume as much normality in their lives and in the lives of their families and children, enjoying education, community, and the meaningful pastimes of life. They're not criminals, far from it. And as all the statistics show, uh, in fact, their motivation to rebuild the lives they've lost is so strong that they become incredibly hardworking members of any community that takes them in. We should all be looking for ways to help them here at home and on the other side of the world. I left off my story without telling you the outcomes. In March, the Greek government brought in several hundred riot police to oversee the building of a new camp that would lock down refugees in a prison-like situation. 
the local Greek militias rebelled at this attempt to harden the wall and block refugees from traveling off the islands into mainland Europe. Street protests and barricades locked down the local town and made it unsafe to walk the streets. One of our vans was destroyed by vandals with chains and hammers, and our volunteers were threatened. After a week, almost all refugee organizations evacuated the island and shut down relief services, including medical, food, and legal services. A dozen of us volunteers from half a dozen countries took the all-night boat to Athens and spent some time volunteering in soup kitchens and projects on the mainland. The next evening, our school was burned to the ground by arsonists. They were later discovered to be neo-Nazis from off the island, and they were tried in the Greek court. The refugees have since been subject to further restrictions, and as the pandemic took hold across Europe, they've been largely marginalized by this new crisis. The risk of pandemic in an overcrowded camp is easy to imagine, but the actual conditions of crowding, poor sanitation, and no security from violence are worsening as just as they are invisible to the narrow lens of the news media and our politics. One happy family where I volunteered is being rebuilt, and I hope to return in 2021 and catch up with the many wonderful people I met there whose lives are frozen in time. Thank you. Joining us now is Rebecca Isanova, the Interim Legal Director of Immigration Law Programs of Catholic Social Services for the Diocese of Fall River. Thank you. Um, what a privilege to follow such a beautiful and fascinating talk by Mark Adams. I especially loved that Toni Morrison quote at the end. Um, it reminded me what an honor it is to do a job that gives me the opportunity to work to free and empower newcomers to our Cape Cod region every day. I decided to become an immigration lawyer after going on a service learning volunteer trip in college to the US-Mexico border near Tucson, Arizona. And I found that like the rough seas that Mark talked about, that refugees battled to get from Turkey to West Coast Greece, just the geography and ecosystem of the desert itself is so inhospitable that it's obvious a person wouldn't undertake the journey like that um, or that kind of migration lightly. People die and lose family members trying to cross that desert every day. They're going on this migration, not really by choice, but as Mark so beautifully put it, um, they're going in search of a refuge and they see the U.S. as that refuge. So after law school, I went back to Tucson to work as an immigration lawyer um, where I helped people apply for permanent status affirmatively um, in this country of refuge. And I also went to the detention centers to help defend asylum seekers and others from being deported back to the countries that they had left and where they feared persecution. I was there about three years and then decided to move back east to be closer to family in 2018. And when moving to southeastern Massachusetts, I remember wondering what will be the same, what will be different about practicing immigration law here compared with Arizona. Is there really much of an immigration scene in Cape Cod? And what I learned was, yes, um, as we've seen in a number of other videos in this series, Cape Cod has a very long history of being home to migrants and refugees, starting with people from England, pilgrims, as we call them, um, and then through the 1800s with the whaling industry and people from um, whaling nations like Portugal, Azores, Cape Verde, and moving on to modern day, when roughly a fifth of the Cape's permanent population is foreign born. And so we have neighbors from all over, including Brazil, Eastern Europe, Mexico, Haiti, and recently El Salvador, especially, but Central America in general. So we have both a rich history and a vibrant present when it comes to people migrating to and settling on Cape Cod. Now coming in search of that refuge, the, that opportunity, those freedoms, as Mark put it, um, just a safe niche to flourish. Unfortunately, much, much like what Mark described on his trips to Europe, it often isn't easy for people once they arrive in the United States. So just like getting to the shores of Lesbos, getting across the southern border, or arriving at an airport in Massachusetts, it's just the beginning of an immigrant or a refugee restarting their life here. Once here, 
There are obstacles of all kinds that can stand in the way of or slow down success. And some of these other speakers in the series have talked about, they are almost universal. Things like loneliness, homesickness, bewilderment or confusion at our new culture or our customs, harsh winters, which a lot of people have mentioned, and language barriers. There are other obstacles that may impact certain groups more than others, depending on their reason for making the journey or where they're from. And those include things like poverty, the expense of living in a place like Cape Cod or America more generally. Then there are effects of trauma and tragedy that may have happened to the person either on their journey or in their life in their old country um, that they came here to escape. And that is a barrier or an obstacle to resettling in a new place. And unfortunately, there are also varying levels of hostility uh, from new neighbors who may have prejudices against folks from certain parts of the world. And those are all just the obstacles that are inherent in being a person who moves from one part of the world to another. But there are also uniquely American obstacles, um, uniquely uh, post 9-11 obstacles in the form of extremely complicated immigration laws, um, extremely expensive applications for immigration and extremely long wait times for those applications to be approved. And so I don't wanna belabor this point too much, but I am an immigration lawyer, so I like to talk about legal aspects when given the chance. And I want to make a few points here uh, that some of you may already know or know part of, um, but that are very important. And I think the main one is that many of us have heard this phrase, uh, immigrants should get in line, you know, come here the right way, get in line. Uh, but this is a fallacy, right? Because what line are we talking about? Um, perhaps a hundred years ago or more, there was kind of a line that people could stand in. And mostly it was just a line onto and off of the boat that they came on. Um, and whether someone got to stay in this country turned on things like whether they were known to be a criminal or a rebel rouser or an immoral person in their home country or whether they had a communicable disease or some kind of feebleness of the mind, a mental disability. Um, but if you could pass those two um, general criteria, you could stay here. But that is certainly not the case now. Uh, the law is much more complicated to immigrate to the US. So to the extent that a line would be a proper analogy in any way, um, the I'd, I'd liken it to be, there being four principal lines instead of just one. Um, and I'd caveat that by saying that these lines are, they're more like a line for a roller coaster in our movie, right? Not lines to get into a restaurant, for example. Because not only do you have to stand and wait in the line for a length of time, you pay that admission fee to the park or the general ticket fee to get into the theater, but once you get to the front of the line, they're also going to check that you meet some additional criteria. So if it's a roller coaster, you're at least this tall to ride, or if it's a movie theater, you're at least 17 years old, or you won't be allowed to ride or enter. So immigration lines are the same. You have to pay to stand in line, qualify to stand in line. Um, and then once you've stood in line, you also have to, fund, uh, to pass a bunch of other criteria that are related to things like um, your criminal history and your health, just like in the past, but also your immigration history um, and your financial status. Um, and all of these things you have to pass to be admitted as a permanent resident or a visa holder. And so just briefly, what are those four lines? These are kind of my, that's my shorthand to call them four lines, but they are for people who have first line uh, close family member who already lives in the US, already a citizen or permanent resident. That's the family one. Maybe they have a job offer usually or um, a truly high level of professional recognition or business capital that they've invested. That's the employment line, which does not include unskilled workers. Um, and then there's a third line of people who have what I call a painful past. Um, they have an extreme need to be here for safety reasons because of some things that happened to them in their home country. And that's like the humanitarian line. And then there's a fourth catch-all line for anyone else. If you have none of those other things, family, employment, or painful past, um, you can throw your name in an actual visa lottery um, or diversity visa line. 
but those are the only lines. And if you don't fit into one of those, then you're out of luck. There's no path for you to come here and walk in. But also, too, even if you do fit into one of those lines, the practical ability of someone to enter the U.S. can still be really difficult. Um, and I mentioned already, there are many criteria you have to show once you get to the front of the line, but it's also expensive to get in the line and to stay there. Um, the initial application is usually 600 to $2,000, um, and often the applicant has no lawful right to work while they're waiting in that line. Or if they do, they have to pay $400 every year, every two years to renew a work permit to keep working lawfully. And then even assuming you can do that, and then assuming maybe you're independently wealthy and you've always been a law-abiding person, you still face this difficulty of just how long the lines are in terms of years of processing times or other wait times imposed by the government. And to give some examples uh, for the type, from the types of cases that I work with, um, the fastest that a person can move to the U.S. Um, through family is through marriage to a U.S. citizen. And in Boston, the average, the normal time is now between nine and 30 months. So one to three years for a decision in the fastest line. Um, and the slowest is for a Mexican parent who is trying to bring an adult child and that wait is currently over 24 years according to Century in Line. Uh, meanwhile, in the humanitarian line, in my office, we have asylum seekers who filed in 2009 who are still waiting for their initial hearing or not their initial hearing, their final hearing. Um, and we have survivors of violent crime in the U.S. who put themselves at risk of deportation by calling the police about their crime, assisting in the investigation, and they're now entitled to lawful status because of that, but they probably have about 14 years to wait between submitting their application and getting a decision. And so all this means these people are in limbo, limbo for years at a time, wondering, you know, will I be able to make this? big migration. And that's in addition to all those other challenges in hearing the migration that I mentioned before. So where I work at Catholic Social Services, we offer a number of programs to try to help immigrants on Cape Cod navigate all these legal and other challenges. We have an office in Hyannis and a number of satellite locations on Cape Cod where we traditionally offer English classes, housing advocacy, housing assistance, emergency shelter, transitional housing, and of course, immigration legal services. Some of these are unfortunately scaled back right now, uh, temporary unavailable because of the pandemic. Um, so for example, ESL English is not happening right now. Uh, but we also have new programs during the pandemic. Um, one is that with the help of many partners and organizations, um, we have a program aimed at addressing the fact that immigrant families are facing all these same hardships that the rest of us are during the pandemic, um, but immigrant families were left out of federal assistance programs like the stimulus check. Um, and so we are accepting donations from community members and grants from local foundations and then distributing 100% of those dollars directly to immigrant families on Cape Cod and the Highlands. But so uh, for the immigration office in particular where I work, we are still open through our phone lines, doing all of our work remotely, and we offer direct representation services where we will take on these full legal cases, pro bono or low bono, um, for a variety of immigration processes. We are trained in trauma-informed care and survivor advocacy. We have partnerships with local women's uh, foundations and counseling providers and other wraparound services um, entry points so that we can meet our clients where they are in terms of their holistic well-being um, as they make this big investment to their life in America. A full third of our staff are immigrants themselves who can really connect with immigrant experience. We can offer services in-house in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Cambodian Khmer. And we specialize in many of the areas that I mentioned before. So we do family petitions for spouses, parents, children, and siblings of citizens and permanent residents. We do deportation defense, generally. We do applications for asylum, um, unaccompanied minors and adults, both in and out of the deportation court setting. We do job 
DACA applications for the DREAMers. Uh, permanent residency and other visa applications under the Violence Against Women Act for survivors of domestic violence, um, other violent crime, and human trafficking. And special immigrant juvenile status, or SIDGE, uh, you may have heard of, for children who have been abused or neglected by one or both of their parents. And then we also do citizenship, naturalization, uh, with an emphasis on helping people with disabilities um, or housing insecurity, or people with a reformed criminal history um, who might otherwise have trouble passing the citizenship test. Um, and what I'd like to say about citizenship is just that that is the real destination, right, for immigrants to America. These temporary visas, asylum status, even permanent residency status, they are all great and they are important points on the way. But with citizenship, you know that you have all the rights of someone born in this country. You never have to go back to the country you left if you don't want to. And you can vote and serve on a jury to help make this country the best version of itself now that you're here. And so if all migration is, as Mark conveyed, um, the pursuit of a niche or a freedom or a refuge that fits a person just right, then I would say that I am truly proudest when I watch my clients stand up and take that citizenship oath, because I know that it means that like the pilgrims 400 years ago, like myself in 2018, this person has finally found their niche or their refuge for themselves right here in Massachusetts.